In this video, you're going to learn how to use auto loads in Godot to make singletons and shared type files that you can use across your game and how to responsibly manage using singletons in Godot. You're also going to implement items. So you'll look here and see we now have an items key line here. It's saying what items are in a room. And if you go to a room where there are no items, like if I go east, you'll see no items to pick up. And you're going to learn how to make this text and customize it as needed. Let's get started. Alrighty, so the first thing we need to do is actually create our items. Before we do that though, just because we're starting to get a lot of different files, scenes, scripts, etc. in our file system here for our project, I want to do a little bit of reorganizing to make this a little bit nicer. So I'm not going to do anything super deep or complicated, but I'm just going to make a new folder and I'm going to call this rooms. Again, remember in Godot, if you can, it's best to keep your file names or your folder names, excuse me, lowercase. I think it, it's especially with Linux, it preserves some compatibility with just um, naming schemes. So just keeping things lowercase is the best all around, all OS, um, if you can. So within our room, rooms folder, I'm going to drag a room GD, room.tscene, our room manager GD, and our exit.gd. So basically anything that deals with rooms or exits, I'm going to put in here. And this might crash the, this. Okay, hold on. Sometimes you get an error. So if I save, it looks like things worked. Sometimes when you move things around, Godot can get a little finicky. Make sure you do it within the editor, though, and not within your file system itself within an OS window like Finder um, on Mac or Explore on Windows because Godot will handle renaming and, and moving things around the way it needs to. Okay, and now that we have that, I'm gonna make one more folder and I'm gonna call this input. And this is where I'm gonna put any of our UI input elements as well as our code that's handling some of our input. I won't put our command processor in there yet, but just to kind of separate some of our uh, UI elements. So I'll just make folder, call it input. And then basically input, input history, input response, response, etc. All of these that are UI elements that show our input um, or just handle the actual entering of the input, not the processing, but the entering. I'm going to drag all of these into input. And there we go. Now I can save and I'm just going to run our game just to make sure everything is working as expected. And so, okay, you realize we've got a, there's some paths I've got to update here. So I'll just do input slash that and then input slash that. And I'm going to go through and make sure all the paths are updated. You might have to do this on your own if you are also refactoring, which you don't have to. But I'll come back in just a second when I've got all the errors fixed. OK, so our game is working. I can run it and it will pop up and we can play it and everything is good to go. So now we're ready to start working on items. And so the reason I wanted to do that is because in order to just start making things a little bit nicer, I'm going to add a new folder called items. And now we've already got a bit of this similar folder structure set up. So when I add items, it's just a continuation there. And so to make items, we're gonna do a similar thing that we did with exits. We're gonna make them a resource. And the reason why is because at least at this point, there's not really any visual representation we need for items. Even if we did show them in our map or to be map or in our developer interface, we could just output as part of the room description or another thing, just list all the names of items in the room. We don't actually need the item itself to have any visual, uh, any nodes. There's no visual component to it. And so we're going to start it as resources. And that means that, again, like we talked about in the last video, Godot is going to automatically handle reference counting those resources it'll handle making sure um, they load in correctly and if we do want to modify items and save them in their modified state it'll be really easy to do that because items are serializable by default in Godot so there's not really any reason not to use resources instead of just a reference so we'll just use an, a, a resource for our items okay so let's make a new script here I'm going to right click on the items folder and hit new script and I'm going to say item.gd and if I open this one up, we'll see all this default boilerplate stuff. And we're going to change this to not extend node, but to extend, you guessed it, resource. All right. Now that we have our item resource, we are good to start making our items or adding the properties to it. And if you remember with our exit, really, it was just kind of a data container. Exits right now don't do much on their own besides some common functionality like getting the other room from, you know, whichever room is calling it. And so we'll add some similar things to our item, probably just an item name and item type right now. And then it'll be a good foundation later on for us to extend as needed. OK, so if I go back to item, let's start adding some properties on here. And really, there's two properties that I want to add right away. One is the item name and another is the item type. So my vision for items, at least at the beginning, um, you can really go overboard with items and trying to make them easily customizable. My favorite way of making uh, making something 
able to be customized, but without adding all these ridiculous rules, a nice balance so that you can make them quickly while also giving a nice amount of flexibility is to define strict types or some, define some variants and then allow, um, allow customization beneath that once you've got those in place. And so really what I mean by that is we can define a, a rule set of item types. So an item must be either a key or a potion or a consumable even. And so you, you define these broad item types and then it allows you to customize specific to which type it is. And so you're kind of developing this rule set for items. Anyway, that'll make a little bit more sense as we get going. But what I wanna do is add an item type property to our item. Now, the way I want to define those item types is by using an enum. I think we've covered enums before, but as a brief refresher, enums are basically dictionaries where you define set constant values. And so you can get those constant values and use them kind of as a type almost across your code. And so what we can do is just define a set of constant values that define the possible item types we have. One thing I wanna do, which I'll show you in just a second, is to use an autoload script in a singleton, a global singleton to define those enums. So first let's start, um, let's start adding our properties here. So we're gonna have, and these will be export variables and we'll see why in a second. So we'll do export and we're gonna do string. This is gonna be our item name. So export string var item name. And we can just default this to be a string that just says item name, item name, there we go. And we're going to have an export. And right now we'll just say integer. We'll come back to this export variable item type. And right now we'll just default this to negative one. And we'll come back to this in just a second. So now we've got our item type, but rather than just having integers or strings or just values that are mutable and you can't really be sure of like what you should expect to get, let's make an enum. So first, what I wanna do is create a new autoload script. If you're unfamiliar with those, autoloads are Godot's um, way of creating scripts that are global that you can access from anywhere in your code base. What it does is you attach, you create an autoload script and you tell Godot it should be an autoload. And then when your game runs, Godot will create a node at the root of your scene tree that has that script attached that is globally accessible to any other node, any other script in your game. Now, as a software developer by trade and someone who really loves software architecture, singletons and especially global, you know, global singletons get a bad rap and rightfully so I think because they're easy to abuse because when you're storing a bunch of data in a global singleton, you it can be a crutch where it's super easy to just keep adding more and more data because it can be accessed anywhere. It means you don't have to set up a really nice data flow between your code. And because that, because it's easy like that and convenient, there's a temptation to just keep building it and throwing things in there that shouldn't be in there. And it can lead to a lot of weird bugs and hard to follow code because you're just, every script in your game is basically just accessing and changing these global values. And it, it's, it's kind of a mess. It's not what you wanna do. That said though, there are tons of really useful and important things you can do with global scripts, with, with singletons, with autoload scripts in Godot. And so I do wanna use them. And one thing I do in a lot of games is create a types global script, a types autoload. And all it contains is enums and maybe some functions to get like, you know, the string names of enums, et cetera. Stuff that doesn't store any data, but it provides types that any script in our code can use without having to worry about cyclical dependencies because our autoload scripts never pull any types in themselves. So if that didn't make any sense, don't worry, we're gonna go through all of that in just a second here. And so I'll show you how to make an autoload script. So what we want to do is come to our file system and I'm going to make a new folder and I'm, call, I'm going to call this globals. The reason I do this is because it's immediately clear that any script within this globals folder is autoloaded into my game. So I only put scripts in here that become an autoload. So we'll call it globals. This is another reason we did our refactor of our file system because now we've got this pattern that's easy to follow. So I'll right click on globals and I'll hit new script and I'm just gonna call this types because it's a script that's going to contain our types, our enums that we can pull in across many places. And if you're kind of catching a whiff of uh, TypeScript in here, uh, that would be because I do love TypeScript. It is my preferred language and so it's hard for me not to pull some, some TypeScript ways into, into my code. Anyway, so we've got this TypeScript, right? If I come in here, you'll see it's got all these things. Um, we want to create an enum here, right? And I'm going to say enum item types. Now, if you're not familiar with enums, again, it's really just a dictionary of static values. So we give the enum a name, and then we use brackets, and then we basically just give a list of values. And you want to make these capitalized because these are constant values. They do not change. 
And so this is where we're gonna have all of our item types, like a key or a potion or whatever other item you wanna have in your game. You can customize as necessary. For us right now, for this video, just for our first item, we only want a key. So we're gonna write capital key, and that's all we have to do. And what this is gonna be set to under the hood is the value zero. So it's like item types of zero is key. If we added another, it'd be one, two, three, et cetera. So by default, by default, Godot assigns integer values starting at zero to an enum. And this is helpful because it means that whenever we get item types dot key, we're really just passing an integer around. So it's a nice way that it's compatible with the rest of your code. And now, so we've got our item types here, right? But we need to actually make it an auto load so it's accessible to the rest of our project. In order to do that, I'm going to come up to our project setting or our project button up here, hit project settings, and then auto load. And here I just need to find the path of the script that I want to turn into an auto load. So I'll hit this button here at the little file button, and you'll see I'm already in res, globals, and then types.gd. So if I hit open and then hit add, all of a sudden I've got a new auto load, auto load script, excuse me, with the name of types. This is the path to it. And it's, it is enabled to be a singleton. With auto loads in Godot, they don't have to be singletons. So you could theoretically from code instance multiple of them. Generally, you don't really want to do that. I'm not sure at least. I can't think of a case where you wouldn't want it to be a singleton. But we do want it to be a singleton in this. And so now we've got it. So if I close this and save it, all of a sudden our types.gd script will be accessible anywhere in our game. Because Godot will realize that every time our game starts, it's going to add a, no, a node to the top of our scene tree, to the root. Um, with this types script attached and we can access that from any other script in our game So to see that in action now we can come to our item.gd file and here we can actually change this Exported value not just to be an integer, but if I start typing types watch this You'll see how it auto completes. It's because Godot realizes this is an auto load So we can use this for auto completion. So I hit types and now watch if I hit the dot here uh, We'll start getting options of what we can use and there's a ton of stuff on here, so I'm not going to go through this. But if I start typing item types, which is the name of our the enum we created, you'll see that also pops up. And so Godot has this really cool functionality, this, or this really cool feature, where you can use an enum as an export variable type, and it'll only let you choose from the editor the values that are actually part of that enum, which is exactly what we want. We only want our items to be an actual item type. So rather than setting it to be any integer, we can limit it only to the uh, values that are part of our item types enum. Okay, and remember how I said that enums are really just integers under the hood? Well, that's why we can still set this variable to be negative one by default, but now we can actually change this to be types.itemtypes.key, and you'll see we get auto completion the whole way. And so we're just setting our item type to be a key by default. You know, you could add like a null or undefined item type too if you wanted a better default, but that was a lot. I hope it makes sense. I hope you're kind of starting to see why auto loads are helpful. So we've created this nice types file where we can add any enums or other types that we want in our game and be able to pull them in. Again, there's no data access here. We're not manipulating or modifying anything. We're just creating data or uh, structural types basically that we can use across our game. And we're gonna use that to limit the options of item types that we have to the actual item types that we wanna deal with. Okay, so let's actually start adding items to our game. One thing we're gonna to wanna to do is add a line under extends. We'll do class name item, and I'll show you why we're doing this. Um, it's so that we can actually create item resources now by giving it this class name. We've, we've identified it to go Godot as a named custom resource. And so what I can do is if I come to our items folder, I can right click on it and you'll see there's a new resource button in Godot. Now we didn't use this for our exits, our other resources, because we were creating them strictly via code. And I think ultimately, at least for now, for this tutorial, that's how we'll create our items. But I wanna show you how you can create and modify resources that you custom make from the editor. So if I hit new resource, you'll see we've got a ton of items here, but if I type in item, we'll see there's item.gd. There, there's a lot of other things called item or that have item in it, canvas item material, etc. But you'll notice that now that we've given our item script a class name, there is this item custom resource we can create. And so if I hit create here, I can say, let's just say key item, give it a better name than I do. Now, Godot also lets you define a custom icon, which is what you would see here instead of this little uh, folded page button. But now if I double click on item, remember this is not a node in our scene, so we can't click around and find it that way. But if I click double click on this resource, this key item resource in our items folder, you'll see that all of a sudden on the right side in our inspector, 
we um we get these values here so we can actually edit it from our inspector and here's the really cool thing watch what happens if i change this to be a key so i change our item name to be that and we could change our item type we only have one value in our enum but look how it's it's a bulleted list it's restricting us to the values in that enum now if i click on something else and come away from this notice i save too but if i click on something else and you know we change inspector if i double click our key item again the values stay because like I said, Godot serializes resources by default. So if you edit a resource in your file system from the editor, like we just did and save it, Godot will save that to disk. And so you can edit your items from within Godot itself, which is super, super cool. And I'm not saying this is the best way to do items. Like if you've got a complex RPG, it's still probably gonna be easier to have some sort of a spreadsheet that gets loaded in and manually converted to items. You know, you, you'll have to find a system that works for you. But for our game, a simple text adventure, um, and for a lot of use cases, being able to edit items or being able to edit resources within the Godot editor and to have them automatically serialized is a huge, huge boost. Okay. So that's really cool. That's why I wanted to show you that. And that's why we made our item, um, let me open our item script. That's why we made these export variables so that if we do want to create items via the editor, via our file system, uh, we can edit them too from the editor. We'll keep these as export variables because it doesn't matter if they are or not. But I think what I'm gonna do is delete our key item resource here. And I'm actually going to add our items via code, which is how we're doing it for our exits, which are also resources. And the reason I wanna do that, at least for now, uh, is not because it's necessarily better. You know, you can do either way. But uh, I think just because we're handling all of the initialization of our rooms um, and our exits within our room manager, I wanna also do our items here. So we've got one place where we know we're setting up our game state. And I think this will be, it'll be a little bit more clear why I wanna do this when we have a bunch of rooms, which I'm hoping in the next couple of videos, we can actually take some time to create new rooms. We've been doing so much functionality that we've only got two rooms right now. So I hope on, on your own, you've been extending the game a little bit cause it's kind of boring right now. But um, yeah, I think I wanna create our items within our room manager just to keep things consistent. Again, I wanted to show how you can create resources within the editor so that you can pick which way works best for you, but we'll do the code for now. Okay, now, so to add items, if we go to our room script, you'll notice that when we add exits, because we gave our exits a class name, we don't actually have to use preload or load or anything. Godot is able to pick up what an exit is. It's able to pick up that it's a resource. And we can just say exit.new here. And so we're gonna actually be able to do the same thing for items because we have given a class name to our items. So what we actually need to do is add a new function to our room, and I'm gonna call this add item. So I'll say function add item, and what this is gonna take is an item, and we can type this as an item because we know that that is a class name we've defined. And so what we can do is call this add item function both at the beginning when we're setting up our game and creating items, and theoretically later down the road, if a player drops an item, for example, we can call this same add item function to add that item to our room. Now, before we can finish this, we actually need to create some kind of an array or dictionary, whatever, to store our items, because now our room doesn't have a way to store items. For our exits, we used a dictionary, and that's because we wanted to have pretty explicit directional names associated with it. But for our items, the items will have names themselves. We don't actually need to associate an item name in the dictionary or anything. So we can actually just use an array and we might change it later on. But for now, I think having an items array is totally fine. And so what I'll do is just type pass in our add item function for now. And then under our variable exits, I'm gonna say variable items, and this is gonna be an array. Again, I don't have to explicitly type that, but I will. And it's just gonna be an empty array. And what we can do in add item now is say items.add or append, sorry, item. And that's all it's gonna do. It's just gonna append um, this item to our array. Okay, so now we have an items array and the ability to add items. Now you'll notice that this add item function, the way we've defined it, requires an existing item. We're not passing in you know, a name and a type and then constructing the item but we are just passing in an existing item. So that means our room manager right now is gonna be responsible for creating those items, which is fine. We can, again, change this later on, but just a bit of an explanation why we won't create our items in the function itself, like we did here. It'll let us use the same add item function, again, while our game is running as well, if the player in the future, we add a drop command or something. 
So we can go back to our room manager now, and this is where we'll actually be able to start adding items to our game. Okay, so let's add a key item. And right now, I think all we're gonna do is have, eventually we'll lock the door from our house to the outside and we'll have to use this key, so we'll make a key. Um, so you'll have to do it to unlock it. In this video, we're only gonna get to actually creating the item, and then I think the next video we'll probably do player inventory so you can pick up the key, and then after that, we'll get to unlocking rooms. But unlocking rooms is gonna be really easy to do, um, so it should be a pretty short video. But in this video, let's just focus on creating our key. So what I can do is say variable key, and I can say item, and you'll notice it'll pick it up, and I can do new. And we're just gonna create a new item. And now, Right now, as it stands, we have to manually edit our our uh, item properties. So I have to do key dot, you know, item name, and you see both of its properties here. Um, let's kind of follow a pattern we've done before and add a function to our item that lets you set these these things from the the get go. Okay, and so you already know where this is going. We'll say function initialize, and here we're gonna say item name underscore. This will be a string, and we'll say item type. Now, when I try and give our item type here a type, a parameter type, notice if I start typing types dot item types, oops, sorry, item types, and actually make this our function and hit pass here, you'll notice we get an error saying the identifier item types is not a valid type. So here's one downfall of using enums in Godot right now, which I think is gonna be fixed in Godot 4. Here's hoping, please, please God. But, um you can't use custom enums. You can't use type or enums as custom types. And so what we have to do is actually change this, our item type to be an integer. So this is a big bummer um, because we can't limit, you know, the uh, what's coming into an item as an item type to a specific set of integers. We have to open it up to any type of integer, but we can just assume that whenever we're calling this function, hopefully that we're gonna be passing in an integer that falls into our item types enum that we've defined. So this will be changed eventually in Godot 4, but right now we have to just set, um, whenever you wanna pass in an enum value, you're just setting this to be of type integer, unfortunately. But that, that's totally fine. And so now we've got this initialize function and we need to do self.itemName. And again, if you're not familiar with self, the reason we have to do this is because we're calling item name our parameter, the same as our item name field. And so if you don't include this self, it's gonna try and change the parameter value, which is not what we want. So we wanna say self.itemName equals item name the parameter. Parameters always take precedence over uh, fields or properties. And so if you have a parameter, the same name as a field or a property, whenever you use that name without the self keyword, it will always refer to a parameter within the scope of a function. So we're saying self.itemName equals item name. And then we can say self.itemType, because again, remember, item type is the same name for the parameter and our property up here. Self.itemType equals item type. And just like that, all of a sudden, we have this initialize function that we can use from our room manager uh, to, to kind of initialize an item's stats once we create it. So again, this isn't maybe the way we wanna do all of our items, but it is a way we can at least do it for now. So we can say var key equals item.new like we already have. So we're gonna create a new item and now we can see key.initialize and here we can pass in a uh, key. Uh, yeah, I don't know, we, I guess we can make more creative names for this later, you might have multiple keys, but for now we'll just have one key. And then remember the second parameter is the item type. And so what we can do is types.itemTypes dot key now it's already going to be set to key because that's our default for now but we just want to be explicit about setting what it is okay cool so now we have items that are being created now we need to actually add it to our game so let's put this in our house room so you know you can organize this function however you want i'm probably going to do all the things for one room at a time so we'll connect the exits for the house room and then add the items so remember that we did a we um had an add item function which you'll see in our autocomplete here and here, all we need to do is pass our item in, which is key. So now we are creating a key and we're adding it to our room. Now, there's one last thing we wanna tackle in this video, and that is there's a key that is in this room, but the player has no idea that it's there. We're not displaying any text that would hint to the player that there's a key there. But what we really wanna do is provide some text or something that can indicate to the player that there is an item in this room. Okay, so if we go to our command processor, you'll remember it's within our change room function where we're actually building up the strings that we display to the user. And what I wanna do is actually take this exit string and the strings array that we're doing and 
move these to our room class, our room script, and actually have functions that return these here. So now our command process won't be responsible for building any of these strings, it'll just get them from the room. So what I'm gonna do is copy our line 48 through 52, the exit string and strings variables that we have. I'm just gonna copy them, I'll keep them here for now, but come to back to our room. And what I'm gonna do is create a new function. I'll add mine after add item, but you can put whatever. And I'm just gonna say function get full description here. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna return a string. Okay, and so I'm just gonna paste in the, the code that we had previously. And I'm gonna return a full description here, which I'll make as a new variable. So variable full description, okay. So what we need to do is build up this string array and then also add our items to it. So we want the player to be able to see what items we have. Now I'm gonna, we need to rename this a little bit because we don't need this new room variable anymore that our command processor had. We're just looking at our current room. So room name, room description, just get rid of all the new rooms. Okay, so we're gonna modify this function so that we just return a string. We do all of the building up of the string array within our room script. So in order to do that, I'm going to kind of take what we have here on line 29 where we were building up our strings variable and make that our full description. So I'm gonna just copy and paste this, or I'll do command X and just set it equal to our full description. I'll just copy it in there, get rid of strings here because we don't need that variable. And now all of a sudden we've got this full description. So we're just returning this here. Um, what I want to do though is break, have this one big function here that will return all this into one string, but I also want to have individual functions that will do each of these lines on its own. So for example, I'll add a new one, function get exit uh, description. I don't know if description is the right word here, but we'll use it for now. And so what I'm going to do here is just copy this exit string that we're making, get rid of that and copy this into this new function. And I'm actually just gonna return what we're doing here. So return this join pool string array. And now for exits, instead what I'm gonna do, uh, in, in get full description. So in this function, instead of using this exit string, I'm just gonna say get exit description. Um, and so maybe what we actually want to do here is um, drag out our exits and move this down below. So we're just returning our get exit description. Let me grab this string right here and I'll copy this. So all we're gonna return is get exit description. And then what I'm gonna do is concatenate that with this pool string array that gets joined. And then we can do the same thing with our room description itself. So this is our room name and room description. So I can make another function called function get room description. And I know this is kind of confusing saying get room description and get full description. That doesn't really make sense. So we'll rename this in a second, but what I'm gonna do is just, uh, again, command X this line or, or cut and paste it down here and get rid of that, the comma at the end. And I'm just gonna return this string. There we go. And now what I can do within our get full description, within the full description array here, I can just say get room description. And the reason I want to do this, the reason we're refactoring here is so that if at any point we need to just get this line in and of itself, like just get the room description or just get the exits or just get the items, for example, um, the player can just do that and it'll make it really easy going forward. And we're still able to join them together in this nice full description array here. So now what we want to do, now that we have the room and exit description, is add one for items as well. So what I'm going to do is add a new function. I'll put it in between the two because I think we want items to come before exits. You can change the order as needed. But I'll say get item description. And this will be the exact same format we've done so far, which will just return a string here. And we're just going to return, similar to our exits, we'll say items, colon, and a space, and then, oh, whoops. Okay, and then we'll do, we'll concatenate a new pool string array, pool string array. And here we will go through items and just kind of add them all into our, into this pool string array. Now there are better ways to do this than this. For example, you might not just want to say items, a key, a potion, etc. You might want to make it more subtle or make it like, you know, in a lot of the old text adventure games, you'll have text like something shiny in the corner, like you're not sure what it is. And you're kind of making the player do some of the work to guess or figure out what items are available. So you can refactor this as needed. Maybe you add a hidden description to an item. So when the item is not in the inventory of the player, it uses the hidden description, which is a little cryptic. 
So for example, you could add that, you, you know, you can do all kinds of customization to this if you want. But for now, just for the sake of getting this tutorial done, we're just gonna explicitly say, here are the items you can pick up in this room. And I think that's okay for now. And so to actually start adding our items to this array, and actually I don't even think we'll need a pool string array. I'll come back to that. First, what we wanna do is make sure that we actually have items in this room. So we can say if items.size equals zero. So if there's no items, we can just return no items to pick up. You can make that text whatever you want, but I'll just do something simple. And then we can do say variable item string. We'll make this an empty string, and we're just gonna concatenate all of our item names and add them uh, to this string, we'll just build it up. So this is why we won't actually need an array. And just to be sure, if we go back to the item script, we'll remember that item name is the name of the item. That's the variable that we wanna get. So if I come back to our room here, what we're gonna do is just do a for loop. We'll do for item in items. And again, we're sure that we have items in here now because our items.size uh, is greater than zero. And we'll just say item string, and we'll do plus equals. So we'll concatenate item dot item name so we're gonna add all the names and then we'll also add a space in here just so that they're spaced out. And then we don't even need this pool string array anymore. We can use items and then plus or concatenate item string, just like that. And all of a sudden we've got this get item description function and I can add this up here to our get full description. So say get item description, just like that, add a little comma there. And all of a sudden we've got this really nice get full description function that's gonna get all of this together for us and just return this full description. At the same time, we can get the individual items and exits and whatever if we need to. So now that we have this get full description function, we can come back to our command processor and instead of doing exit string and strings, all we need to do is actually just return new room dot get full description and it's going to handle all of it for us and you see how much nicer there this is now that we've moved all of the building of these strings and handling of it to our room itself so our command processor is only responsible now for processing commands and it's our room itself that's getting all the descriptions and handling keeping track of which items and exits it has so this is a really nice change that's going to clean up our command processor a bit we've still got a fair amount of exit and uh, working with rooms in our go command that's fine we might get to changing some of that later but i think for now we've already done a good job of making this better. And now we can start to see when we go to certain rooms, we should be able to see whether there's items. So now if I run our game, we should see all of a sudden, look, look at that. We've got the same description we had before. You're in a house, random house, etc. And look at that. We've now got an items line here, which says that there's a key there. And if I go east, we'll see no items to pick up, which is exactly what we want. And so we've got this really awesome, easy to implement item system now. And if I go back west, we'll see our key is still there. Now we didn't actually do the take command, so it won't be recognized. And I think I'll, I'll save that for the next video, but we have our item system in place. Now we're ready to implement player inventory. And then after that, actually get to locking and unlocking doors. Thanks so much for watching everyone. I really appreciate it and hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, a like and subscribe to help support the channel are always appreciated. We'd love to have you in the Discord server. The link to that is in the description below. And if you do find my work helpful, donating me a coffee on Buy Me A Coffee helps me to continue making great videos. Link to that also in the description. Thanks so much for watching. See you in the next video.